Um, at the uh, at the end of uh, of Janine's fabulous talk this morning, she made the comment that we study gender and sex differences um, in health to improve the health of women, and indeed we do. At the risk of being a spoiler to my talk, I just want to add a friendly amendment to that. As we study sex and gender uh, differences uh, and influences uh, on health because of the health of women as well as the health of men. Uh, and uh, that's kind of where this talk is going to go in a few minutes. Um, so what I'm about to do is take you through, I guess in the interest of time, about a 15-minute fairly whirlwind tour through an entirely descriptive set of studies. There's almost no analyses. It's just going to be showing you raw data. It represents data from around the world and over administrative data collected over the better part of a century um, in places where, um, where such data exists. Although I'm not going to show you all of it, the data themselves are actually pretty complete. In other words, we took the administrative data from every country in the world as far back as their high quality administrative data go. Um, the, the work that, um, that I'm going to describe uses strictly ecologic data, which is to say summary administrative data. There's no individual level uh, data here. And one thing, just apropos of, uh, of Marsha's talk, is I'm not going to be talking about any aspect of cause of death. And the main reason for that is not that it's uninteresting. And I think uh, Marsh has given us ample reason to want to look at differential um, or similarities in causes of death, but because the quality of the data is too poor. And although from developed countries in recent years, we have reasonably high quality data on causes of death, um, given, given what death certificates uh, are good and, good and not good for, the reality is that uh, most of the data from most parts of the world um, are measure the simple, easiest thing there is to measure in health vital statistics, which is whether someone's dead or alive. So there's not a lot of question about the, um, about the quality. The study that I'm going to show you, this collection of, of, uh, of administrative data that I'm going to show you descriptively, uh, was a, a collaboration among five of us. At least one of my collaborators, I think, is in the room, Mike Biacci, a fantastic biostatistician here. Victor Fuchs, who some of you know, an economist uh, here on campus who spent many, many a day in this very building. Um, Karen Eggleston, likewise, an economist over at, uh, at FSI. And uh, Pooja Loftus, a, uh, an analyst of extraordinary quality. So having done that, uh, let, me, let me dive right in. And I'm going to start right here at home with some, uh, with some US data. This is county level uh, summary of data showing differential survival to the age of 70 of white men. And I think the data uh, are from, from the year 2000, but we repeated it with uh, uh, data from the American uh, Community Survey a decade later. It's, it hasn't changed. So you can see we've got some counties in the United States, including the one we have the good fortune of being of sitting in today, in which a white male um, can expect about an 80% chance of making it to the age of 70. Uh, not terrible, especially when you compare it to places like, say, Huntington, West Virginia, where the chance for a white male to get a Social Security check, at least if he's clever enough to wait, uh, to wait for the, uh, the ideal date, the chance is almost as low as 50%. And in fact, I'm not going to show you African-American data, but it would shock you uh, how much even worse that is. Now, on this slide, without showing you the, the comparable uh, map for, uh, for women, we showed you one of the things that emerged as we started looking at these data, which is we just now plotted, we just plotted uh, you know, basically the, uh, the um, propensity of, of different, uh, different uh, results for the different counties in the United States. And you can see men and women enjoy completely different distributions. They do overlap a little bit, but you can see that, that in many counties, the average, first of all, for women is, is about 0.12 higher, so that women have a 12% higher chance on average across the country of making it to the age of 70. Um, but you can see there are many counties in which women have almost a 90% chance of making it to 70, um, and, uh, and even, even the poorest performance of women um, ranks up above the mean um, for men. <clears throat> And at first, we imagined that this possibly was somewhat randomly distributed, or that the relationship of individual counties might be somewhat random. Uh, but through uh, Mike Biacci's uh, excellent, uh, excellent observation, you'll see that randomness turns out to not be the, the bottom line. So we decided to go ahead, try to look at the differences between 
uh, between survival for men and for women by looking at things that we could easily measure, measure administratively. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at them. These are things we could get from census. These are things that derive partly from census and partly from other very easily available administrative data sets. And we decided to look at all the things that might matter, climate, pollution, differences, easily measurable differences in, in, uh, in the quality of health care, a simple measure of diet, and some demographic issues, urban, rural, south, non-south, ethnic mixing, and so forth. And lo and behold, um, it, it turns out that these are the things that explain for every individual county, both for men and for women, things that matter strikingly with socioeconomic status. But perhaps, and this again shows you how well those variables explain the different counties. There's no weird outliers out there. But the, 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 the differences, which I'm about to show you, and somehow I may, have, uh, I may have missed the slide. Let me just go to this one for a second. The, um, the differences turned out to be very, very, very non-random. That in some counties, we had extraordinarily big differences, as much as 12 years if you translated it into life expectancy, which turns out to be true in many of the counties that you can see dotted around the South. Whereas in counties like the one we're sitting in, men and women do pretty, pretty much the same. There's about a year, year and a half difference in life expectancy in Santa Clara County between men and women. And I think I even have a, another map. So just look at the first three panels, the A, B, and C. And you can see that, in fact, the socioeconomic slope for women and for men in terms of mortality is very, very, very different. So that, I don't know if I have a pointer here. Let's see if this works. So you can see in places where there's no poverty or where income is extremely high or where low education is very rare, very rare men and women do about the same. When you get out to areas where there is deprivation of one form or another, in fact, the ratio of male survival to female survival, which I depict down here, dramatically increases. Men do very poorly under adverse conditions. And women seem far more resilient, and that indeed was the title of the, of the, uh, of the paper. But I actually want to take you, um, I want to take you on a little bit of a different journey. We're going to hold that very, the D panel I just want you to hold off on. And since I somehow misplaced it. Um, but I do want to talk about at least, at least a framework for how we might imagine these differences to occur. And again, it's, it's not nearly as, as focused as the chromosomal or biologic framework you've heard quite a lot about already this morning. Um, but, but again, I'm not going to spend a ton of time actually talking about the content of these things, but merely just to tee them up so you can at least get a sense of what could be some differences. So one difference, broadly speaking, could be biology. And we've talked a lot about that this morning. Another difference could have something to do with the, way, the, the ways men and women live their lives in terms of actual things they do. So it turns out, I think it's not a surprise to any of you, that, that uh, women on average have had much less dangerous occupations, not just currently in the United States, but around the world. And historically, back to the earliest origins um, of homo sapiens, as we understand it, um, women are far less likely to engage in dangerous pastimes of one form or another, less likely to be drug addicts on average, on average much less likely to smoke or drink heavily. Um, so that could be an area. And then finally, there's this very complex notion of sociobiology. How, how do men and women live? It may actually be different. And I'm just going to leave that, that sort of differential dangling out there. We'll come back to it after we've uh, gone around the world. And I am having a little visual. Oh, here we go. Visual aid problem. Anyway, is this just an American phenomenon? In the next few minutes, I'm going to convince you it's not. So these are the, these are the, um, the high income countries, or a sample of the high income countries of the world. And again, we're looking at how men do relative to women in terms of survival. I think this is life expectancy, and I'm going to be moving back and forth between survival to 70 and life expectancy, because some of the data sets provide data for one but not for the other. And I think you can see it's a pretty robust relationship. The, the R is over there. It's greater than 0.8. Um, you can see there's some moderate outliers. We're going to talk a little later about who those outliers are and do they give us any hints as to why this relationship is true. But again, it, it, it's entirely consistent. And in fact, I think on the next slide, I'm going to show you within a couple of countries. I think I've got uh, Japan here and Spain. But from virtually every single developed country from which we have data, the data are the same. If you look at the richer areas of those countries where education is high, where occupations are generally high, you see very small differences in male-female survival. 
but in places where the um, environment is less favorable in terms of education and, and resources, you see far greater disparities. I should point out, since I didn't mention it when I had the maps up, there's not a single county in the United States, nor a single county or a single country in the world, if you accept a few sort of ravage-torn, strife-driven, what, what the ILO refers to as the, the group four countries, um, in which men actually outlive women, although historically we will see that. So this is, um, speaking of history, we just want to take you back a little ways in developed countries before we move to the developing world or the, the, um, the, the rest of the world. Um, and this is sort of how things have progressed over the last four decades in the United States, actually five decades, dating back to, to 1970. The, um, the point is this is statewide data, not county data, because we didn't have it granular enough to, to get to the county level. But I think that the most striking thing is things are getting better. Not surprisingly, by things are getting better, I mean men are doing better relative to women, which should not surprise you, given that there's been substantial economic development since 1970, although I'm going to talk about other developments since 1970 a little later. Um, but you can see that, relatively speaking, the slope of that line has not very much changed over the years. That the, the gradient, the differential gradient between how men do and how women do in the 50 states in the United States still ranks pretty much the way it did back in 1970. Same is true in the, um, in, the, in the rest of the developed world. So these are the rest of the so-called Group 1 countries, advanced countries. And you can see that not only is the slope is more or less the same, the curve itself is sort of rising, which means men, on average, are doing better relative to women. They still haven't caught women. It's unlikely that they will, we'll, uh, as we'll conclude at the end. But you can see the other thing that's quite interesting is that the, the, um, the quality of that relationship, the robustness of that relationship is getting stronger over time. So you can see it quantitatively at the bottom, but your eyes can, I think, see everything that, uh, that I want to see. You know, it's just kind of fun to see how this has evolved. And the main point I want to make from this slide, these are, again, these are century-old data, now actually a little more than a century-old data, from developed countries from which we have this high-quality administrative data. And the most striking thing is that for countries like the United States and like most of Western Europe, before epidemiologic transition occurred, which occurred around 1900, women did not live longer than men on average. So this is historically a relatively new phenomenon. And it's not, it's not one that's going to require a great deal of basic, basic science, to use uh, Janine's term. Because it's, it's pretty clear this is, again, looking at the uh, at the, at the chart over time, I will not explain why this gap appears to be widening enormously around 1970 and now appears to be narrowing a bit. It's a very, very interesting historical question. Um, but really what I want to show you is, is to try, having now shown you what developing countries are starting to look like, to try and get at the question is why is it that, the, that, that in the very poorest of circumstances, or before the modern era, prior to 1900, why is it that women died younger on average? And one of the things you can see is looking, for example, group two countries are like, for those of you that don't look at, at, at countries this way, they're countries like you know, Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, China is now a group two country. These are rapidly developing countries that you might confuse if you got off an airplane and went to a hotel as developed countries. And they have many characteristics in common with developed countries. And you can see in the group two countries, it's been true already that women are doing better since 1970, and now they're doing better and better and better. And even the slope is rapidly changing. And for group three countries, so now we're talking about countries that are just beginning to get their development act together, you know, a Vietnam, a, an Ecuador, uh, countries like that. You can see that back in 1970, women were doing worse. And then bit by bit, they start to assume exactly the same pattern that we're seeing in developed countries. So I'm trying to show you two things. First of all, I'm trying to show you we're all going through. We missed it for we don't have data to really observe the so-called middle, you know, upper, upper income developing countries, um, the group two countries. So we don't know for sure. But it seems pretty likely that sometime between around 1900 and 1970 that they, too, went through this transition from having a, for having women uh, largely doing worse all of a sudden what the rest of us all have, which is women do just great. And uh, I'm not sure I have the slide that will depict this. Um, I'm going to go through this. This is, this is really interesting to show you what happens. You can even see within a single country the, the, the transition. 
So this is China, and you can see um, Karen, Eggleston, uh, Karen Eggleston's colleagues in China helped produce this for their 2,000 or so provinces. And you can see that when you look at all the provinces together, there's almost no relationship between, between sex and, uh, and mortality. And remember, this is all sex. We haven't come to the gender part of this story yet. Uh, stay tuned. Um, but when you then separate the country into the developed part of the country, which are the cities, and the still very lagging developing parts of the countries, you see the curves in reverse direction. So you see that what it used to be like, but it won't be like that in another 10 or 20 years in the rest of the country uh, as well. So why is it that, um, that women die in, um, that women are dying young in very poorly developed countries before transition? And just because we don't have time, it's normally a fun thing to get people to speculate, but this has to do with maternal mortality. And once women start dying in childbirth, fertility rates drop enormously during transition, so you now have the, the double advantage for women their fertility, their, their number of, of pregnancies is many fewer than it used to be, and the risk of dying per pregnancy is much, much lower than it used to be. Women get to ex experience their entire more or less natural life expectancy, whatever that is, and all of a sudden they soar ahead of men, and presumably, barring a terrible epidemic of some kind or another, we don't expect it to ever go back the other way. So, so in nature, once one serious natural problem is eliminated, which is the problem of uncontrolled childbirth without the benefits of modern medicine, um, the natural advantage of women comes to, to the fore here. This is all four groups of countries lined up by year. Group four countries are the countries that have not gone through transition. So think about the poorest islands in the Caribbean, like Haiti. Think about countries in the South Pacific that uh, essentially have no deep infrastructure. A Madagascar, the, the poorest post-conflict countries the poorest countries in the world. And you can see it's very hard to talk about male-female differences because there's so many deaths from things like epidemic diseases still. There's so many deaths from, from, from violence um, because these are, are often war-ravaged countries. But if you look at the, at the remaining three groups of countries, including ourselves in group one, you can kind of see it almost looks like these dots are connected. It basically staggered 40 years. The rest of the world is just beginning to catch up with us in terms of its of its uh, sex-specific mortality patterns. This is just a slide to show you that, it, that at least as of, as of the, the last several decades when we can actually measure this data, virtually all the maternal mortality in the world is in those very poor countries. Thank God, thank God, thank God. But this is one problem. It's not a gone problem. It's actually rising shockingly in some parts of the country. But the absolute levels are extremely low so that they don't actually impinge on the uh, average survival or life expectancy of women. Very quickly, I wanted to show you the most interesting part of the world because it played out so fast is Eastern Europe, um, which you know has gone through a rather remarkable political transition and with it a big social transition. It's also the place that if you're a man, you least, least likely want to live, at least if you care about survival. Um, so even at the best of times under, under very stable Soviet rule um, in the Eastern Bloc and in, and in, uh, and in the Soviet Union, uh, male survival was pretty bad relative to an international standard. You can see that at 0.9, that would be kind of like, you know, uh, West Virginia. I mean, it's not, it's not terrific. Um, amazingly, it, um, it, uh, it got worse until about 1980, which for those of you who know some history is when Gorbachev came into power. A variety of very serious efforts were made to, to try and improve the culture, the infrastructure culture, a story we'll come back to in a minute, um, and men did better for a few years. In fact, until the Berlin Wall came down, men did very much better. And then all of a sudden, the society was blasted with a huge disruption in terms of its social organization. And this is, I'm telling you this because we're going to talk in a few minutes about, about gender norms. And you can see largely what happened to the survival of men. So over a period of less than five years, life expectancy of men plummeted from about 70-ish which is what it was in Russia in, um, in 1990, to 55, making it, you know, from a survival point of view for men, probably ranking in the bottom 20% of countries in the world. And although it has, not, it has not wildly recovered in some of those countries, in most of those countries it's recovered quite admirably as they have begun to develop more stable society. This is just to show you how East Germany has basically begun to catch up and now now the survival of men in East Germany is almost identical to the survival of men in, um, in West 
Germany. I'm not going to show you this. Many people have tried to explain the, um, the horrible epidemic in Eastern Europe on alcohol differences between men and women. And I guess the only point of showing you this slide, which you can look at, is that there are two oblasts, two large regions of the Soviet Union that are Muslim, and which alcohol consumption is extremely low. And they went through exactly the same pump. So if the, whatever role alcohol is playing as a, as a pathway through which men uh, found it convenient to kill themselves, it doesn't explain what was really going on in this environment. You can see that when you look, interestingly, within these countries, either between them, um, over the period of time, they're actually behaving still like other Group 1 countries. Um, hold on. Hold. No. No, I don't think the war can explain it. I think this is explained by the dissolution of, the, of, the, of state communism in Eastern Europe, because it occurred in every single country, which would not have presumably not have involved, for example, Poland or the Czech Republic or any of those. So we come now back to the, the differential. What are the, 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 the possible drivers here? And, um, and hopefully I have the slides in enough order so I can show you a few things. Now, up until now, I've relied completely on descriptive data with virtually no analysis, but I think most of you would agree that the data are themselves pretty compelling, that these differences are not arbitrary or random or subtle or require a huge amount of statistical manipulation. From here on out, I'm moving to speculation. I'm going to be showing you basically some reasonably anecdotal data, so treat it for what it is. But I do want to make the case, and this was the purpose for my being part of this panel today, that it is likely that much of what is keeping men back between high and low resource environments is not the money per se, but the social culture around which the money often um, serves as grist. So let me just show you a couple things. So this is just, this is just slightly reorganizing the data from the group one countries to show you how, um, how these countries line up. Um, if instead of using um, male-female survival for the moment, we just, start, we just look at how these countries line up on a gender equity score. This is a WHO uh, and UN gen gender equity score. We actually modified the score to remove life expectancy, which actually had been one of the, one of the, the, uh, one of the components of the way the score had been measured. And I think you can see we've got some really interesting outliers. And it turns out that, that Japan and South Korea, which also are, are also typical of high you know, developed countries now in terms of their SES, uh, and so forth are not typical of the rest of the high income countries from a, from a gender equity point of view. And in fact, they have very different cultures. And I think you know, if, uh, if, if, uh, if women are on Venus and men are on Mars, they certainly, in, in the United States, they are way more so even still in, um, in those two countries, just to, to pick an example. And now you can see when you, when you look at survival, as a function of this gender equity score, you can see that it actually, along with and separate from the, the GDP measure, actually adds a substantial, explains a fair amount of the, of the variance here. At least suggesting, and I'm just going to show you a couple of other little suggestions, suggesting that gender equity is one of those features that's associated with high socioeconomic development that may explain why it is that men do so much better. And again, I'm trying to remind you, we're talking about gender equity helping men survive. It's not, not the way you normally think about this. So, <laughs> well, it's actually all the more ironic since, since someone makes the comment about work. It's all the more ironic that this has occurred at a time when women have joined the, danger, the dangerous trades, when women have joined men in doing many of those very things we might have thought dangerous. So again, I now want you to look at the, at the, fourth, call, the fourth panel here that, uh, that we passed over, which is this is just going back to the US data. And we just took for each of the, of the, um, the 3,000 counties, we took a measure of occupational similarity. Um, and we basically looking at the, at the likelihood that, that men and women were doing the same, at least kinds of work. We're not, this is not highly granular. It would, for example, lump together professional and managerial level jobs as the top tier, and of course we all know that there's quite a range. Um, you know, being, being a, a, an executive is not the same as being CEO 
and being a school teacher is not the same thing necessarily as being a department chair in a university. But having said that, I think that you can see that there is a pretty strong relationship, and that relationship stands out and continues to explain a lot of the variance, even after you've taken into account the other three important covariants. So it has independent and pretty strong predictive value. Um, now, unfortunately, I apologize for this miserable slide, but I'll tell you what the point of the slide is. So even within the United States, there are a couple of outlier states. And one of the most interesting, from our point of view, we have our own little Korea and Japan here, is Alaska. So it turns out, not surprisingly, it's one of the richest states in the country. It has a very, very big, for people that don't travel around there, it uh, has a very, very high educational level uh, compared to most of the, of the country. And interestingly, despite the kind of image that it has on TV, um, it has a very high fraction of the workforce in relatively, um, relatively high paying occupations. What it doesn't have, is gender equity. This is a place where the lives of men and the lives of women in Alaska, Sarah Palin notwithstanding, um, are rather different. And uh, again, we're, we're, I, I want to be very clear, the data that we've got is still quite anecdotal. Um, I'm pleased that a uh, very, 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 very uh, sophisticated group of economists um, at Harvard as we speak are actually trying to reanalyze this data precisely for the purpose of trying to make sense of the gender data as to how it fits in quantitatively and how, how strong its explanatory power is. But, um, but I would leave you, I don't know that I have a, a, a last slide. Yeah, I think so. Um, it's at least my sense, and again, I can't make a stronger comment than that, that at least one clear explanation or, or workable explanation for the pattern, look, biology clearly explains something. There's no, there's no place in the world now that we've more or less cured maternal mortality, there's no place in the world where men live longer. And it doesn't seem, it's, it's not a random thing. There probably is some clear biologic advantage that we're not going to escape. But that biologic advantage is actually rather small. The real advantage is sociobiologic and probably has more to do, although we don't know this yet, with the way society functions, as in the gender norms, than the way individuals function, although that will await the, um, the results of our next speaker, uh, Dr. Scheibinger, is going to talk about how we might finally measure gender at the individual level so that we actually can answer the question, is this an individual advantage that certain gender characteristics confer, or is this a function of the societal gender norms that confer some advantage to men by proximity? We, we, uh, we remain to learn. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>